Hi guys, it's Jeremiah from Revolution here today with someone I really, really admire in the watch industry, one of the leading lights of a dynamic brand, uh, and it's Eduard Melang from Moza. Thank you. His family acquired and revived Moza in 2012, and he has been CEO since 2013, so that's almost what, 10 years now, right? Nine years, right? And Can they've done many, many incredible things uh, with the brand over this almost past decade. Yeah. Right, and uh, the last time we saw Edouard was with our editor at large in uh, Switzerland, uh, in Paris, in a bunker in Paris. You were huddled there with uh, Eric Cheng, That's true, uh, with yeah. Eleanor for the uh, Moser and Undefeated collaboration, and that was an incredible watch. So, yeah. what brings you to Singapore? Another collaboration. Cool. So a very long collaboration. Right. And we've been collaborating with um, our current partners, uh, Cortina, for for many years, for generations, actually. actually. Okay. Uh, if some of you guys um, are not familiar with Cortina, it's one of the leading uh, watch retailers and distributors in Singapore. It's a homegrown brand. Um, it started in 1972 uh, by the founder, Mr. Anthony Lim, and uh, he actually listed the company in 2002, uh, I believe. It's a publicly listed company now, and um, it's 50 years old, right? Celebrating this year. Correct. And probably as old as Singapore itself. Singapore is 57 <laughs> years old this year, right? And I think Incredible. the partnership with Moser was started in 2018, correct? That's correct. I think, uh, as I said, it, it goes way beyond that because our fathers, you mentioned yes. Anthony Lim, was collaborating with mother in a previous life with another brand. Right. But uh, that's why we know them for, for quite a long time. And I, my previous job as well, was uh, working with the Lim family. Oh, okay. So we have um, yeah, long-lasting uh, Could you des describe maybe how the partnership started, you know, and how it's developed over the years? I mean, here with, with Moser, it started um, through friendship, uh, good discussions and, and alignment of, of vision on how we want to bring this brand to the next level. And seeing, you know, Cortina being this really anchor retailer in, uh, in for Malaysia, well, in all yes. uh, Southeast Asia, is an amazing platform for a brand like ours. So when we discussed and they said, you know, we have obviously the amazing big brands that they retail and, and and with, the, with which they've been for a long time. And to open the door to a small brand like ours was an amazing opportunity. And we said, you know, for us, of course, we know we're small, but we have ambition. Uh, we, we believe we have a, a strong vision of what we want to do with this brand. They understood and I think liked the, the, the vision we had and they said, let's do it together. So it, it started just a year and a half before the pandemic, but it's been a crazy four years. Yeah, and I think in 2021, Cortina actually acquired and other leading retailers, Sincere Watch Limited. And so I think their presence has really grown in the Asia Pacific region. And it's, and, and it's perfect timing, right, post pandemic. And it, I mean, Sincere is very different in their positioning and the, the, the clientele they, um, they deal with, but both are very interesting for Moser. So we have the, the opportunity, thanks to this acquisition, also to be available through the two different channels. Right. And when I say Moser, it's a dynamic brand, right? Um, Probably most of you will think that they have an iconography on the dial that is minimalistic. And Eduard, I think you've said before in previous interviews that you didn't want the focus of the brand and even the brand name to be on the dial. And you wanted the, you know, the iconic design cues, the minimalistic design cues to be, to be front and center on the dial. But yet that is also underpinned with a real strong authenticity of high watchmaking you know, in the movement itself. Yeah, well, I believe a brand um has to be very clear in the eyes of, or as much as possible in the eyes of the people who, who like, appreciate, follow the brand. So in terms of product offering, what I always try to, to bring is within a certain con continuity, uh, a certain cons consistency, meaning that I want people to understand the next product based on what we've done in the past, but see it as an evolution. So from early on, when we took over in 2012, 2000, 2013, I kind of tried to create a chart of what are the key design codes and on the aesthetic side, but also mm -hmm. the functional design codes. And that helped us as a team a lot in taking decisions in first, you know, saying what is the core of our collection and then expanding it slowly. So we started with one collection. Today we have four different pillars. We have the Endeavor, which was the original one, yes. which is our classic, uh, but with a, an edge, um, I would say. Then we have the Pioneer, which became like our everyday watch. Then we had the Heritage, because we are 194 years old brand and we wanted to talk about the, the past. But again, it's antique, 
but with an edge. And then we have the streamline, which is the, the latest collection. So across those collections, I want people to be able to look at the watches and say, oh, I understand why it's all part of Mosa. Right. They link together. They're very different. If you put like some next to each other, you might say, but, but in a way, if you look at the way we treat the, the hands, we treat the dial, we treat the movement, we treat the case, you understand that they all part of Mosa. And that's so important to me. I want, I, so many times in my, before I, I took over Mosa, I saw some brands where I was looking at the window display in a store like Cortina, and, and I would be like, but why do they have this jewelry watch next to that diving watch? And then they have this very classic silver dial, and exactly. it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You can, I mean, that creates like very, I mean, an heteroclick brand. And I think for, especially for small independent brands like ours, we produce less than 2,000 watches per year. It has to be consistent. People need to understand. And in order to achieve that, the idea was like, if we, we should be able to remove the logo and people should recognize exactly. it. Exactly. And we did. And we went, and then we said, well, then we might as well remove the logo. And yeah. I mean, you, you say Moser has, has four, you know, separate collections, right? But yeah. with a very unique and singular uh, design ethos, yeah. I would say. And this is something that Wei and I have discussed, you know, in previous videos that the brands that have really survived the, the, or thrive, in fact, through the pandemic is ones that have singular vision. Yeah. And we think Moser fits that bill. Uh, perfectly. I think there's a there's a handful of uh, independents that have been I mean have grown through the pandemic because of that. I think you're completely right. It's the debitune, it's the um, the overk, the MBNF. I think right. there, there's probably a handful, and and I think Moser is one of them. Yes. I right. mean we have a much wider range, much bigger volumes, but I think we achieved despite the different collection this unicity and um, stay unique, try to create something special, but consistent. Right. You talk about MBNF, and I know you've done a collaboration with them in the past, right? With Mac Buser, but you've also Three done ago, exactly. you've done other collaborations with, I think, Romaric Andre, yeah. Second Second, uh, with Duke University ALI, uh, ALS to benefit uh, ALS, right? Um, it just seems that Moser has such a unique and independent voice, you know, in the watchmaking industry, and you can you can speak to a a, a value that probably other brands can't. You have that dynamism, you have that mobility and flexibility to, to, honest, to do think, what you want. Well, I think it's, we, we are entrepreneurs. That, that's the most important thing. My brother and I, our family, we're entrepreneurs and we, we know that we cannot stand still. We need to take risks, we need to try things. And when you, when, if we go into collaborations, I think what's interesting in collaboration is not to go the easy way of taking our neighbor brand or whatever, the easy part, and, and just say, well, let's do something together. I think the whole point of a collaboration for us, but also for the customers, is to explore something that we, would have had, we wouldn't have done otherwise. That means explore new territories. And when we collaborate with an unknown small artist from Paris, like Second Second, Romain Condré, or we go undefeated uh, streetwear mm. uh, company from, from LA, it's completely different. But had we stand alone in our office and design a watch, we would have never done the second second and we would have never done the undefeated. Right. And suddenly we come out of that, we learn tons of things from those people, uh, but not only from a product standpoint, but also the way they work, the way they think, it opens new new doors. And MBNF was a great um, example. It was the first time we explored the third dimension. And I'm sure we will talk about the watch that is- Yes, we're coming <laughs> to it, we're coming to it. They wouldn't be this watch if I, if. I don't know, five years ago, uh, Max and I had sat at a coffee in Dubai and said, hey, let's do something together. And uh, it started just talking about dyes and we ended up talking about hair springs because Moser is known for developing amazing yes. hair springs and, and selling them to a, a lot of, of brands, including MBNF and many other independents and big brands. And it's, that's what I like about collaboration. And I hope like everything we tried and yes, it creates a lot of discussion, some people like this, some say but that these are brands that are so far apart. Of course, there are kids buying sneakers mm. that are a huge fan of Undefeated, but you wouldn't believe the number of people who came to me and said, I started collecting sneakers and then I moved into watches. And the fact that my two favorite brands come together is like a dream come true. I mean, I had so many of those. It was even surprising to me, but we didn't do it just for that. We did it because we felt it is different. It's surprising. We want people to really, oh my God, I expected anything from Mozart but that. I don't want people to expect what's coming next. Yes. I want to surprise them. Yes. I mean, we're small, we are independent. And independent is not just to say, well, it's our own money in there. It's also, we think differently. Correct. We take risk and we want to surprise you. Right. We want to make something that is the unexpected. If you want the expected, go to the big brands. Don't come to us. Exactly. I mean, that's what I admire most about Moza. And if I have to be honest, I learned a lot about the brand 
in particular this year when I had to cover you know your releases for Watches and Wonders. So yeah. the watch that you're wearing now, the Endeavour Center Seconds, uh, the green dial, which was released at Watches and Wonders. Your line and, green, yeah. Yeah, and also the uh, Pioneer uh, cylindrical tourbillon uh, skeleton, which is probably the the watch is the like base the, yeah the base for this watch that we're gonna talk about and I learned so much about you know your subsidiary or your sister company Precision AG yes. and their development for hair springs as, as you said I think the cylindrical uh, hair spring came out in 2018 am I, if I'm not well, mistaken? Well we, we, we developed around that time but the first one that we really launched officially was the MBNF collaboration. Right. And That's 2020. Right and if, if I'm explaining it right Maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? Because this is quite technical. <laughs> so what the cylind cylindrical hairspring is, it's two, um, or it's a hairspring with two breguet uh, curves. curves or yeah. overcoils, shall we say, yeah. that are pinned on opposite ends, one at the top and one at the bottom. Yeah. And it vibrates not in the lateral or horizontal uh, plane, but rather in a concentric manner. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's really like a circle that expands correct. Uh, on, on both sides. But what is interesting, usually a, a flat hairspring is held at the center and then you, you have, you, on the flat curve you are held on the outside and the, the hairspring tends to be kind of asymmetrical the way it correct. That's why we create a breguet curve to try to make it concentric. Yeah, for the flat hairspring, right? Yes. But you can't do that. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why a few hundred years ago, actually, it's not new. Huh? They yes. created the John cylindrical Arnold, uh, yeah. hairsprings because they in marine chronometers where they needed extreme precision yes. in order not to hit rocks in with their ships, yeah. they had space. So they had those big hairsprings that could unfold um, uh, symmetrically. And that's very, very important for uh, isochronismus. Now, a few years later, 100 years yes. later, it's very difficult to, to, ma to make those. No, nobody knows how to and make them. And in miniature. And to put them yeah. in, in, a, in a small watch. And that's what we found interesting um, to, to work with. And then we started this uh, with Max. Together, I think they, he he used it in his um, three-axis tourbillon. Right. I can't remember the name of the watch a few years ago. And then oh, not in the Legacy Machine One Hundred One. The, the that was in the One Hundred One. He used a double hairspring. Oh, okay. Now he started with a sim single hairspring from us, and then we moved in. When we did the collaboration, I said, Max. I mean, this is this is an ama amazing platform to show our double hairspring. This has a double exactly. hairspring, but only the owners know yes. because you need to look at We've, the back. No, yeah, but also because you have a purple second hand, which sort of yeah. Is, but also we have a, a blue bridge. It's a know? telltale sign, right? Exactly, the blue bridge is a sign that it's mm. a double hairspring. It's kind of a signature, so, it's, so mm. that people know. It's a double uh, Strauman double hairspring. Okay, now. Yeah. exactly. Sorry, speaking German when you <laughs> use. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, and then you. Um, the, the, we decided with, uh, I told Max, let's put it on, on top. And since then, uh, he has put it on the LM101, the double mm. hairspring from uh, Precision Engineering. And yes, the cylindrical uh, uh, tourbillon and cylindrical hairspring is very complicated to make because you have two curves, which is the most complicated part. It's all handmade. Right. Um, yeah, it takes, I, th I think, eight times more uh, time mm. <laughs> uh, to create a, um, a cylindrical hairspring. Than and does Moses still yeah. test its hairsprings and its balance wheels? Um, together and then you do a matching with, so with yeah. the hairspring well, and, the, and the wheel? Not together, we have machines that are actually back from the 70s. These okay. are very old machines which um, test the, um, the strengths and, uh, and the frequency of the, of the hairspring and, um, and separately the, um, the inner shear of, mm. uh, of the balance wheel. And then we classify them from one class one. In to different the, groups, right? Yeah, class one to class 20. We usually try to stick to, to 10. When we do a good job, it's, it should be 10. Mm -hmm. And then like a one goes with a one. So the stronger one goes with a bigger inner, inner shear. So that in the end, it's, by doing that, it's, it makes it the life of the watchmaker possible in the right. sense that it, they can regulate the watch. And that's the only way if you want like a cost level of, of uh, regulation, you need to classify. Uh, entry level watches would have counted, so it's that you don't match the same, uh, you don't get the same precision. But it's usually because it's industrialized products. We're not industrializing our products, so we need to classify them, which is another step, but it, it, it brings top precision. Right. And it allows the watchmakers to regulate to the second. I think, I think this is something that the automotive industry also does, you know, matching an engine to a transmission. But I've never really heard anyone else do it in, in watchmaking. Well, I think it's a, it's a standard uh, procedure if you want high precision. Right. You're not the only one, but that's what we offer to our clients. Yeah. Right. Well, to Moser for being the first client, yes. but yeah, to all the other clients who want a certain level of, of accuracy, then uh, we need to classify. It's a bit more expensive. 
but, uh, but for that you get a top quality, top reliability, hairspring, balance wheel, oscillator, if you, if you call it this way. Amazing. I think we should probably proceed to talk about this watch, your latest collaboration. We're super proud to be uh, associated to the 50th anniversary of the Cortina and uh, to celebrate that with them. I think there's a handful of amazing brands that uh, had the opportunity to collaborate. And um, so they came to us and said, we would like you to be one of those brands collaborating and creating something special for our 50th anniversary. We said, of course, I mean, it'd be great. And they said, what would you do? And then we started brainstorming. They said they would like to do a small series of quite high end, like very representative of what was it as well. At that time, they didn't know we were working on a skeleton with cylindrical uh, tourbillon. Which is the caliber uh, HMC 811, right? Yeah, that we launched uh, this, this spring, actually. Yeah. This is really our newest movement. But at that time, so a year and a half ago, we sent them drawings and said, listen, we would like to do this. We think it would be very, really, very really good. I mean, it's, it's uh, and, and we really came close to what you see today, really right away. We said we want to do an Endeavor tourbillon cylindrical skeleton. And they're like, but you've never done a skeleton. I said, but trust us, it's going to be good. It's going to be, I mean, it shows what we, our capabilities in terms of hairsprings. It, it's a very spectacular movement and it's in the Endeavor, which is something we, we've never done. So it's kind of bringing the traditional case of Moza with our latest movement. And the idea was really like, in a way, it it's summarizes the few years of collaborations that we had with, uh, with, with Cortina in a very elegant yet very contemporary manner. Right, because when, when I first saw this movement in the Pioneer, I mean, that you classify that as more as your sports, your sports yes. model, right? Yeah, because if we look at the dial, it has Roman numerals exactly. so instead of the global different. light, right? That is so used the, in the Pioneer. Yeah, the first we did with Pioneer uh, that we're starting to deliver now is very three-dimensional. It's following the collaboration with Max. I said the next step is really to explore full heads on the third dimension. So I want a three dimension dial, I want a, third dimensional, a three dimensional movement and a three dimensional hairspring. Of course, we had the tourbillon with the cylindrical hairspring, that was easy. Then we incorporated in, uh, in our development for a skeleton for Moza, and then the dial was three dimensional. It's ceramic uh, indexes, uh, ceramic hands, so that's the global light you, you mentioned. Yes. Here we want it to be much more classic. That's why we went back to something, there's no uh, Luminova on the, on the hands or the dial, but you have the Roman numerals. And it completely changes the, um, the identity of the product. Exactly, but even then, the dial itself is curved. You know, when you look at it, you look exactly. at it straight on, it may not seem that way. It is nicely curved start, because yeah. we, we like it to be as close as possible to the sapphire glass. So you can get that um, good readability, uh, even though it's a sub dial. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to look at. There's just convex and concave shapes all around. You look at the bezel. To get it's a very lugs. complex case. It's yeah. a very complex movement, and even the back, we we worked a, a lot on the on the on the on the appreciation of the movement. So if you look at the back, you see the beautiful uh, rotor that we've skeletonized, skeletonized as well, so you can really uh, yeah. appreciate what's behind it. And even though this doesn't have you know your signature uh, thin and wide Geneva stripes because these are skeletonized bridges, right? You still get a very nice dark grey and thresite. So that's, that's something we're working on now more and more is this dark gray finishing for our more sporty line. So we, okay. we will uh, explore that more in the future to have maybe two families of movement for the same caliber could have two finishing. One for the classic Endeavor Heritage and one darker like this one for Streamliner and Pioneer where we have steel cases and right. I, I want to create a little bit more contrast between the movement and the case. Yeah, but the, the contrast here works incredibly very, well. Very gray nice, yeah. and with the, you know, the brightness of the rose gold. It is something that, I don't know if it's forever, but I think this anthracite, like darker color with rose gold works very well. And uh, it's a little bit more modern. I don't know if it's there for, to stay or if eventually we go back, I mean, as an industry to more um, like this rhodium type of, of colors. But personally, I like it a lot. Yeah. Do you know what's the height of the tourbillon cage? Because it's so raised and I, I, close, to, I'm, I'm not sure. close to the dial. Well, the only unfortunate thing is you're only making this in 10 pieces. Yeah. <laughs> the Pioneer is not limited, but this yeah. one is limited here yeah, to 10 pieces. But um, no, but to, going back to your question, um, it's really like we, we build the case based on the, on the tourbillon. So the tourbillon turns, right? So there's one moment that it comes like three tenths of a millimeter mm. to the sapphire. That's the limit. Uh, we need a margin of about three tenths of a millimeter. And we couldn't have made it more compact, but it's, you know, it's a very, it's, Considering what you have inside, it's yeah. a very compact watch. You can, I mean, if you show it from the profile, we also have a curved sapphire at the back exactly. to make it very, um, 
wearable on the wrist. Exactly. Right? Very comfortable on the wrist. It's a 42 millimeter case, so very comfortable to wear. What are your, your future plans for, for expansion with Cortina within the region? I think right now is, uh, is really like trying to supply watches. We know it's very frustrating in, in the watch industry right now. It's uh, a lot of demand and not enough supply. And especially for small brands like ours, it's difficult to grow. So we are working on, on planning better so that on our side, we're trying to expand a little bit, uh, to grow a little bit um, in, the, in the near future to be able to supply better. We might close some point of sales, concentrate a little bit more so that there's enough okay. products. I mean, right now it's, it's sometimes frustrating. You go to uh, some of the stores and you see nothing or there's one or two watches left. Right. Um, and, I mean, we want people to be able to experience and feel and touch our products. So we're looking at, at that. And then, um, I don't know, one day maybe boutiques and things like this. We're opening in, in Hong Kong, our first boutique in, uh, in November, very nice boutique. We're looking into China, um, in, in Dubai as well open boutiques, so maybe Southeast Asia eventually. It's not a priority right now. I mean, we have an amazing exposure in prime locations here. Mm. It's, you know, you go to Paragon, you go to uh, those places. It's, it's amazing. So we, we have no rush in other markets. We had the, the, the need for better visibility here. I think we are working with the best in the mm. prime locations. So we have great locations in those multi stores. And, um, but we're exploring. I mean, how can we get more people to, to know Moser? As I said, there's a lot of people li like what I we don't do. I don't think you really have a problem with that, <laughs> with, no, with innovation like that. It's important to continue to, uh, you don't want to stand still again. I of mean, course. We see big brands now um, suffering more than small brands. Why? Because maybe they got lazy. I don't mm. want to be lazy. I want to celebrate every watch we sell. That's a tradition at Moser. We have a, a chat internally with pretty much all the staff where we mm. say, listen, there's this amazing piece was sold today here or there and everybody clap or is happy. We shouldn't lose that. It's not because now we, we, we do with that, uh, 2000 watches when we, when I took over, we're doing like 400, mm. um, that we should stop that. Right. We should make, un understand people that, you know, selling a watch is, is a big thing. I was so much work and, and to bring it there, it's, uh, it's not because now it seems more easy. And I yeah. have younger guys coming and joining the team. It's like, oh, I have nothing to sell. Mm. I'm like, don't think it's going to be forever like this. Enjoy yes. the moment because yes. you never know. And continue to be uh, hungry and, and, and treat your, your, your partners, your client well and, and find the new ideas, etc. Stay relevant. It's important. So we're constantly like, brainstorming for new things and try to find yeah, surprises and do the unexpected. I would say beyond size or even innovation, I think what the consumer market is looking for is that familial feeling. They want to know that they can get to meet yeah. and understand, you know, the watchmaker, uh, what their the values people, yeah. are. Yeah, and, and kind of build that relationship. I think that's what people are looking for. They're not looking for you know, something that's run of the mill. That's what makes yeah. our life exactly. fun also, right? I mean, I've been traveling Southeast Asia now for a few days and been a while but going to events and then meeting all those people say oh you know I, I've been seeing you guys and I love what you do and then we start discussing chatting they give us feedback it's fun and um, I wish more would come to the manufacturer and visit because I mean I get a lot of that right but I think it's more important that the watchmakers get that they yes. are the people who actually make the watches so yeah. they get the, the same feedback which is very encouraging you know and brings meet, a lot of energy meet the passionate collectors yeah, who yeah. are collecting these so we're trying watches. more and more to do that to engage and bring people to us and and again we need um, we need to explore collaborations we have a lot of ideas for new collaborations we have uh, a lot of ideas for new products and um, anything you might want to share or tease right now if you could uh, uh, well, a lot of people tell me, oh, it seems like, you know, your collaborations goes a little bit in, in all directions. I said, no. I disagree. I, I, yeah. I mean, we had a year where we did watchmaking. One year we did more art. Yep. This year we did fashion. Exactly. And next year it's going With to the be, armory, right? Yeah, armory yeah. and undefeated. So it's, um, and we continue. But I like to, to work with them. So if you look at one, maybe it looks like, why did they do that collaboration? But it's part of, a, of an idea. So I think next year, the topic should be around uh, our history. So okay. um, you can expect some collaborations talking about the history of Mozart. All right. Hopefully uh, we look some good surprises there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Edward, for taking the time to, to speak with us. You know, big congratulations on thank you. the partnership with Cortina and, you know, to the team at Cortina as well. Thank you so much for, for having us. Happy 50th. And we hope to, to see you again soon, Edward. And thanks to yeah. you and the entire Revolution team. You know, we're very happy to speak thank with you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.